there wouldn't be a time that when you were near the edge of the bank that you didn't stop and have a look at the river and say to yourself, what's the river doing today? Actually, most people um, probably don't realise when they're sitting next to a big rock on a braided river like this, there could be a spider about, you know, this big sitting underneath that rock and is quite likely to be. Welcome to race five of the Bok Kayaks Brass Monkey Race Series. The Waimakariri River, whose name means cold, rushing water in Maori, is an iconic example of one of New Zealand's finest environmental treasures, the Braided River. The Waimak, as it is affectionately known by locals, is located on New Zealand's South Island, where it flows down the eastern side of the Southern Alps mountain range. Well, it's one of New Zealand's largest braided rivers, and braided rivers are quite rare internationally. They're found in Alaska, but Canterbury's got the majority of New Zealand's braided rivers. They've got birds that have evolved to cope with the quite difficult circumstances on the rivers, like the rival. It's the only bird in the world which has a beak that twists to the right. With the Waimakariri, the headwaters are in Arthur's Pass National Park. So you've got those very dramatic landscapes near the pass with the beech forest, the backdrop of the Southern Alps, and then the big braided Waimakariri coming down and reaching the sea and having a really important estuarine area at Brooklyn's Lagoon. The braided river is the only place really where you've got sort of indigenous nature that's got more of a stronghold. So it's like a corridor from the mountains to the sea of a more natural wild in New Zealand that hasn't been domesticated and converted to farmland or city streets. The thing that makes the Waimakariri particularly special is that it's so close to Christchurch and that it's relatively unimpacted by abstraction and dams and those sorts of things so far. The fact that it's close to Christchurch means a large number of people can come out here and enjoy it in the evenings and in the weekends and they can look at things. And the fact that it doesn't have any dams on it so far, any major dams, the fact that the amount of abstraction is still relatively small means that most of the natural character and the dynamic nature of the river is still in place. There are many tributaries that make this river. So it's understanding that whole river system. I think this river is what, something like 150 kilometres or 95 miles long. And it tumbles down out of the mountains and then it comes through the, through the mountains and out into the foothills and then out onto the plains. And, and it's these rivers that have created this lovely big flat plain, the Canterbury Plains. A braided river ecosystem is really characterised by a lot of different types of habitats. There's a lot of different places in which are shaped by the type of flow that they have. And so they range from the major braids, which really have the, the most amount of water going down them and are most flood prone, minor braids, you know, which are you know, split off. Then you get into sort of small seepages and ephemeral springs. And then you have perennial springs, which are quite often at the sides and are driven by large amounts of, of water which are upwelling from underneath the system. The thing that you need to, need to understand about a braided river system is that all the water that's going down in it is just not the water that you can see on the surface here. There's a lot of subsurface flow, flow in quite often in what we call the hyperreic zone underneath the main bed of the river. We had a lot of snow, then we got nor'west winds and a lot of rain in the Alps and when the peak of the flood hit it was a high tide it was a, a what they call a, a spring tide and it all hit about the same time and, and that's what the term is a hundred year flood. Gorse has traditionally been an agricultural pest and but when it establishes in the riverbed again it takes over and the seed source stays there for quite a while. So that's why you need the big flushing flows because when you've had the Waimakariri in full spate you will get some of the gorse, some of the broom just sort of scoured off the riverbed and the uh, bed becomes much cleaner and, uh, again. But where you haven't had that and where the river is sort of channelised you do get it colonised by these weed species. 
At first glance, braided river basins such as the Waimakariri might seem stark and devoid of life, but there is a broad range of flora and fauna that is uniquely adapted to living in the harsh conditions found along braided river corridors. The ribos are really interesting and I, I think really neat bird, uh, mainly because they seem to be really well adapted for living on this um, braided river floodplain. They've got a, a bill which is uh, a short sort of forceps like bill which is actually bent to the right. They can use that bill for you know getting into, um, into sand, into mud, under rocks, for picking things up out of little pools. Things like banded dotterels seem to feed in a, a bit more of a, a large range of habitats. If the river's in flood, for example, the banded dotterels will come up and, and feed on terrestrial insects. They'll feed a bit more on the, the minor braid habitats. Maybe they're not quite as good as the ribills at getting right underneath there and, and taking things off the undersides of, of the cobbles and pebbles. South Island Pied Oyster Catchers, of course, have this big, long bill. They can get into quite deep water. They can also get into mud, and quite often there's a lot of silt and mud and sand on Braider Rivers, and that'll have aquatic worms, which will live in those sorts of habitats. The, the black-fronted terns are, are quite often are foraging by flying along, and they can hover, they can see things in the water, they can dive down and grab them, and they can also catch insects on the wing. The birds have uh, quite a lot of adaptations for dealing with uh, the suite of predators which historically were present on Braided Rivers. Things like black-backed gulls which are, are flying around, aerial predators, Australasian harrier hawks, those sorts of things. And they do that by basically using camouflage. And so the, the little um, banded dotterels and ribals are really hard to pick up, particularly their nests. Uh, and their chicks are really hard to pick up on a, on a braver riverbed because they're just so small, they're, they fit in so nicely with the grey, wacky um, cobbles that occur on the braided riverbed. The braided river birds like the banded dotterel, the ribel, the black fronted tern, they nest on the shingles of the river. It's just a sort of little scrape in the gravels. They won't nest in weeds amongst broom. They like to see what's around them, to see any predators. And so if broom or gorse colonises the riverbed, the birds won't, won't go near it. And weeds on the riverbed also provide cover for predators like feral cats, stoats, hedgehogs and that reduces obviously the breeding success. So we really need to invest much more in controlling weeds and getting the clean bare gravels back again. Beyond the threats to individual species, there are threats which affect the health of the river as a whole. At the moment it's a big irrigation scheme called Central Plains Water and they're proposing to take 40 cumex from two sites on the Waimakariri, at the gorge and at the near the Kauai River, and that will have a major impact on the river's ability to support Raider River birds, its health as a river, and it will probably lead to quite big changes down at the river mouth as well, because the river will lose some of its uh, flushing flows and it will change the whole natural regime of the river. And then you have other environmental impacts like the contamination of groundwater. These rivers feed an underground system, water system, aquifers, and these are a major source of drinking water for people. And this is all at risk by the dairy farming. We've got a big increase in dairy farming. And on land which was traditionally light, uh, land and mostly grew crops and sheep. So now we've got this intensive dairy farming with all the effluent and the high use of nitrogen fertilizers which is having a big impact on our groundwater and our surface water streams. A major reduction in flow would also have an impact on the recreational activities practiced on the river. I was trying to work, uh, focus on my taking the right lines. Um, 
Last race of the, se of the series should be faster. <laughs> I'm doing a bit of training, but um, no, all in all, I was pretty happy. Took up fishing with my brother, and the summer season started. So we set out to go down fishing, and the fishing spot was about a mile down the river in a big hole down there. So we fished for a while, and then suddenly I hooked into one, and everybody was giving great advice, hold your rod up, put it down, do this, do that, but we managed to get it into the boat. And after a few more casts, and um, I managed to hook into another one more. Two, two, two salmon on your first day was just, just unreal, and I never caught anything for the rest of the year. So uh, I suppose you'd call that beginner's luck. The salmon's journey ends in the high alpine springs, where they create riffles as they build their nests. The springs are particularly special and, and quite different from the main braided river, although they're connected to it. They're different because they're really stable. The rocks on the bottom of the springs typically doesn't move. They get, can get really well-developed algal biofilms on tops of the rocks. So, so, they're, so they're really a lot more stable habitats which can be really productive and can feed a lot of invertebrates and food into the main rivers. Invertebrates which are living in the flood prone parts of the river need to be able to come in, colonise quickly, complete their life cycle and fly off as adults before the next flood comes along, before they get washed away. Or they need to have adaptations and behaviours or morphologies which make them resistant to the flood so they can burrow down to the substrate, they can hunker down on tops of rocks, they can move across to the more stable side braids when a big flood comes through. The invertebrates are food for things like riparian spiders like the Dolomites aquatic uh, fishing spiders which live in this riparian zone right next to the edge of the river here which eat stream invertebrates. They're spiders which are um, terrestrial, so they're living underneath the rocks on the side of the river, but they're actually going down into the water, in many cases, to capture their food. And they get that, they've got all these hairs on the outside of their body, so when they go underneath there, they take these, these sort of this coating of oxygen, of air around the outside of them, so they can still breathe underwater. The Waimakariri means many things to many people, but there can be no doubt it is a valuable asset for all. First of all, it's getting out into some of the most beautiful countryside there is and you get up into the mountains and then uh, head down through windy gorges with rocks and the open braided sections and there's always something fresh to see. There's the light on the water and the shape of the water and the birds just outstanding. Oh, the river is very special to me particularly from a, um, a, a point of just watching it. It changes every flood. Uh, you see the river come up, you see it go down, you see it alter course, and it's, it's a very, very interesting thing to, to watch. The, the, just the changing of the river is so spectacular and so special. And the whole ecosystem is driven by this pattern of braiding, a pattern of flooding, which creates a whole diversity of habitats and a whole river ecosystem, you know, the, the whole corridor with the, the springs, the major braids, the minor braids, the braided river birds, the open expanses of gravel, all of that is driven by the dynamic system of the flow regime and it makes the whole diversity of habitats, which is you know, really interesting. It's not found in other, any other sort of river. And there's only a very limited number of pl other places in the world where you find these sorts of rivers. The complex web of interwoven interests in the Waimakariri requires a delicate balance if this waterway is to remain a viable source of aquatic opportunity for future generations. <laughs>